Did we get finished with that? No. Did we even start that? Yeah, we did finish it. Last thing we said about it. Shh, guys, it's my turn. The last thing we said about it was that um, 1937 Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Okefenokee Wildlife Refuge Act into law. And that protected and still does protect the Okefenokee from um, being abused, from companies going in and um, logging, mining um, things out of the earth. So uh, we're going to move um, about 300 miles north here in just a second, but did want to show you some pictures of the Okefenokee Swamp. This is, of course, just a little, little portion of it. Um, that water is moving. It's not stagnant water. It doesn't stand still. It is constantly moving, and that keeps the swamp healthy. Um, you can see again on the map, a little blow-up of the map, exactly where it's located. That green blob just above, actually it goes down to the Florida border. Um, the swamp burns from time to time, and we might think, how is that possible? It's full of water. Water doesn't burn. No, but all that vegetation does. And if you have a spark that is hot enough, it will burn. This, of course, as you can tell from the caption, was started by lightning in April of 2017. And actually, nature needs fire. Forests need fire um, because it cleans the forest. You know, if you've ever been in the woods, you notice if there's a lot of stuff like plants growing, tree limbs that have fallen, this, that, and the other. Fire cleans all that out. Some, not all. There are, and Caleb's absolutely right, there are uh, pines that in order for their cone to actually open and disperse the seed, it has to be raised to a certain temperature, and fire is the only thing that will do that. So it's uh, not necessarily a bad thing. The western United States tends to have bigger forest fires because of the way their forests are managed. They're not, they don't prescribe burn very often, and a prescribed burn is one that you do it on purpose to clean out the forest. Um, so this particular fire, April of 2017, I remember it because smoke came as far north as Putnam County, this area. So it was kind of smoky for several days. Um, and again, it burned for, I want to say three months, June of 2017. It finally was um, under control. It was still burning, but it was under control. Um, and all they were trying to do is to keep it from spreading outside the swamp because there are cities and towns on the outside of the swamp. Huh? Well, they weren't worried about that. I mean, smoke is going to go away eventually. Um, different kinds of wildlife. There are a lot of mammals in the swamp. Um, Told you yesterday there was the black bear. That's a small bear, though. And they don't get very big in the swamp because of the heat. Um, bobcat, you've got an otter. Um, one of the 200 different species of birds or kinds of birds. And then um, Mr. Turtle having a rough day. Because Mr. Alligator's having a turtle snack. Um, so... Again, one of the one of the interesting things to do when you are in the swamp is to, to look at the wildlife because it's it's there. Got a bruise. What'd she say? What'd she say? Noah, what'd she say? So you got a boo-boo. All right. Shh, it's enough about Noah. We got stuff to do. 
So we're going to leave the Okefenokee again. We're going to travel about 300 miles north to the Appalachian Mountains. And of course, uh, we've talked about the Appalachians already. Uh, this mountain range that stretches from um, central Alabama all the way up into eastern Canada. It's about 1,500 miles in length. Part of the Appalachian Mountains reach into Georgia. The southernmost part of the Appalachians are actually called the Blue Ridge. We find them in Georgia in that region that we also call the Blue Ridge. Um, the Valley and Ridge and the Appalachian Plateau are also part of the Appalachian Mountains, but they're not a part of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, this particular chain reaches down into Georgia about 100 miles. Um, you don't have to worry about this. Its northern boundary is um, Highway 5, runs along the McKaysville Basin, up near the Tennessee line. Uh, the southern boundary is the Brevard Fault, elevation about 1,700 feet. And that's where the Piedmont region begins. Now, not asking you to know that, just throwing it out there for general information. By the way, what is a fault? Hmm. No. or any kind of tectonic plate, you're going to have a fault, okay? And there's a couple of different kinds. Um, you know, you can have it where those plates are colliding and they're pushing upward against each other, or um, like the San Andreas Fault, you've got plates that are actually rubbing against one another, and they sometimes they get hung up. Pressure builds, pressure builds. To release that pressure, there's an earthquake, and the land will actually move. Um, it can move many, many feet. Um, so, uh, the Brevard Fault, however, is a non-active fault. It's it's not an active fault anymore. But do we have earthquakes in Central Georgia? Yes, we do. Have them in Milledgeville from time to time. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the fault runs underneath the dam. So there, that tells you how small those earthquakes are. The dam's still there. <clears throat> you don't feel them. You hear them, but you don't feel them. Because they're so small in Georgia or here. All right. Um, Eleven counties make up the Blue Ridge or, is, or where we find the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, again, stuff you don't need to know. You do need to know this, though. The Gulf of Mexico, right down here, we have warm, moist air that comes off of the Gulf of Mexico. You have cooler air over the Blue Ridge Mountains. That moist air um, runs into that cool air and precipitation forms. That's why that part of Georgia receives about 80 inches of rain a year. That's why our rivers and streams begin um, in the Blue Ridge portion of Georgia. Um, the crest of the Blue Ridge Mountains forms what is known as the Eastern Continental Divide. And it runs all the way up as far as the Blue Ridge Mountains go, or actually the Appalachian Mountains go. Um, and what the Continental Divide does is it separates where rivers will flow into. That's all it is. It's, it's a marker that says, okay, rivers on one side are flowing to this body of water, rivers on the other side are flowing to that body of water. And in this case, uh, rivers that are on the eastern side of the Continental Divide flow into the Atlantic Ocean right over here. And there's a couple in Georgia that actually flow into uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the Oconee and the Okmulgee actually form the Altamaha, and the Altamaha flows into the Atlantic Ocean. Then the Savannah River, and uh, as I said up here, the Chattooga River 
also flows into the Atlantic. Um, those on the western side flow into the Gulf of Mexico right here. The big one would be the Chattahoochee River. Actually turns into the Apalachicola River in Florida and then into the Gulf of Mexico. There's also a western continental divide. Didn't y'all go out west this summer? Were you on that trip? Divide? Maybe not. It would have been in Utah, Colorado. Um, so basically, the Western Continental Divide, those rivers on the east flow into the Gulf of Mexico. Those on the west flow into the Pacific Ocean. You need to worry about the Eastern Continental Divide. Okay? Um, map showing. The Appalachian Mountains, that yellow is the Appalachian Mountains. It's about 1,500 miles from where it begins down around Birmingham to the uh, the Gas Peninsula up in, and I know I just butchered the French, but I don't care. Um, up in Canada, that's about 1,500 miles. But the Appalachian Trail, the little red trail, the little red line, is a little over 2,100 miles long. Why is there a 600 mile difference? Okay. What? Yeah, but the mountain range, the mountain chain is, is shorter than the trail. Yeah, it's not a direct line, is it? Um, and so the trail twists and turns ends up being more miles than the uh, mountain chain is. All right. Now the map, you see the Blue Ridge Mountains, Brasstown Ball, see the Okefenokee Swamp, you see the Chattahoochee River and the Savannah River. All right. Um, over here, you've got um, the Brevard Fault. And again, it is a... It's an extinct, it's an ancient fault line. Um, it's not active. Um, but you can see that's where the, the Piedmont region actually begins. And then the blue line is the Eastern Continental Divide. And you can see with the black lines, if it's on the right of that blue line, it's flowing into the Atlantic. If it's on the left of that blue line, it's, fall, it's flowing into... Um, the Gulf of Mexico. And then you can actually go to cities that are along the Continental Divide, and there's usually a sign that says, hey, Continental Divide's right here. Out west? Or in, did you? Well, yeah, Maine, you would have. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, so, let's talk about some of these rivers. The Chattahoochee, way down yonder. Um, the Chattahoochee begins in the Blue Ridge region, um, up around Helen, Georgia, and it flows southwest toward Alabama. It takes a hard left and flows into the Gulf of Mexico. It at its origin, at its headwaters, it's really just a creek. It's a very fast creek, very shallow. Um, really, for most of the northern part of the Chattahoochee, you can't, it's not useful for boat um, travel. Um, but you get around Columbus, actually past Columbus, the water uh, or the river broadens, it deepens, and transportation, and it still is used for transportation. Uh, people have lived along the Chattahoochee River for somewhere between twelve and 10,000 years. It's when the first um, humans arrived in Georgia, we think, because we're not really sure. We just think that. Um, and they settled along water. Why do people live along the water? Okay, agriculture, what else? 
Okay. Fish. They got to drink water, right? Well, not 12,000 years ago, they weren't making hydroelectric power. So, a lot of different reasons people live along the water. Transportation, trade, all of those are reasons. And uh, Georgia's no exception. So the Cherokee settled um, near the headwaters of the Chattahoochee up around Helen in the Blue Ridge part of the state. The Creeks eventually settled um, below Atlanta, between Atlanta and Columbus, um, and across the state toward the Savannah River. Um, so the Creek are actually a much bigger tribe in Georgia than are the Cherokee. Um, World War I comes along, 1918, it's over. And then shortly after, um, people begin building dams on the Chattahoochee River to harness the power of the river, to generate electricity. And so we'll look at a map here in just a few minutes that shows um, a lot of dams that were built on the Chattahoochee. Several of them, three or four of them are still in use. Shh. Um, the Hat Chattahoochee provides most of the drinking water for um, Atlanta and Columbus. Um, Atlanta, it comes out of Lake Lanier, which is a lake above Atlanta. Um, there was a lawsuit that was just recently settled between Alabama, Georgia, and Florida over the Chattahoochee River and the amount of water that Georgia takes out of the river. Um, Alabama and Florida think it's not fair, but the Supreme Court said Georgia could do what they want to. Huh? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look, but it's significant. It's, it's so bad. We're working on it. It's so bad that Apalachicola Bay, which sits, oh, right here. Um, the Apalachicola River flows down from the Chattahoochee um, through Florida into the Gulf of Mexico, and it's called the Apalachicola River, Apalachicola Bay. Um, until recently, it was the finest oyster fishing in the southeastern part of the United States. Last year, um, the Florida Department of Natural Resources shut down all oyster fishing in Apalachicola Bay because there's not enough water bringing the nutrients down that those oysters need to thrive. And so they're trying to rebuild the oyster population in that area. Um, that's how much water Georgia takes out of the river. Yeah. I mean, it, it, technically it starts in Georgia. Um, but that just goes to show how valuable those sorts of resources are to, um, to people. And in this case, three different states. All right. Um, in the middle of the Chattahoochee River Basin map, you can see it starts up near Helen, Lake Lanier, West Point Lake. Um, that's actually Lake Eufaula. It's called the Walter F. George Lake also. Yep, and uh, Lake Seminole down on the Georgia-Florida line. Terrible band. Um, on the right, you see what are essentially the headwaters of the Chattahoochee River. It's a, a creek. It's not much to it. You see on the left, that would still be up in the mountains. Not much to it. You're not going to travel by boat. But you get down to Walter, Lake Walter F. George, and you, you can move by boat. Not only on the lake, but on the river as well. Walter F. George, Lake Walter F. George. It's also called Lake Eufaula, which is easier to say. Um, this is that map that shows the different dams that have been built on the lower Chattahoochee. Uh, the West Point Dam, 1975. But you see all the other ones that were built. Those have been torn down except for um, Oliver. Um, dam, which was built in 1959. The rest of those have been torn down. Um, and then you get the Walter F. George Dam. Um, you go a little further, you get the Jim Woodruff Dam um, down 
on the border between Georgia and Florida. So a lot of lakes um, are were formed on the Chattahoochee to generate electricity. This is the dam at uh, Lake Eufaula called the Walter F. George Lock and Dam. What? Uh. Now, um, you can actually go, you can drive your boat from Lake Eufaula to the Chattahoochee River or vice versa using the lock right over here. <laughs> This is the lock. Um, think the Panama Canal. Panama Canal has a lot of these. Um, but if I wanted to go from the river to the lake, I would drive my boat inside the lock. They'd close the gate. They'd fill it with water. And then I can sail out the other end. To come back, they would do the reverse. Um, and most of the lakes on the Chattahoochee have that kind of thing. Um, because there is boat traffic, not just pleasure boats, but commercial boats as well. Um, the Savannah River, other side of the state, the Savannah River forms the boundary between Georgia and South Carolina. It is a natural boundary. It's crooked. That's how you tell the difference between a natural and a man-made boundary. Natural boundaries are crooked. The Mississippi River used to be the western boundary of Georgia. Yeah. The Pacific Ocean used to be the western border of Georgia. Long time ago. Um, and then we began, it began to be sectioned off, turned into other, other states, given to other people. Um, the Savannah River begins at Lake Hartwell, which is up in North Georgia. It flows about 313 miles towards Savannah. It goes through the Piedmont, it goes through the coastal plain, and it empties into the Atlantic Ocean about 15 miles below Savannah. Um, it is what we call an alluvial stream. And what does that mean? It simply means this. That river begins in the mountains, it flows across the Piedmont, it, crawl, it flows across the coastal plains, and as it does, it picks up the bodies of little dead critters, of big dead critters. Um, they, of course, um, decompose in the water, or they decompose on land. Those nutrients are washed into the water, but the water of an alluvial stream is very nutrient-rich. And as it reaches, um, in this case, the Atlantic Ocean, it dumps those nutrients into the salt marshes and on the barrier islands. Um, and so it serves a very important function. Um, it really feeds those coastal marshes and um, the islands as well. Um, it is today used as a source for hydroelectric power. They're dams with turbines and they generate electricity just like Sinclair Dam. Um, but there are a couple of interesting places on the Savannah River. The Savannah River nuclear site is where they used to make nuclear material for uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and it is where they do research on nuclear power, nuclear uh, material. Uh, today they also dispose of nuclear weapons. So that's Nice to know that we're so close to something like that. Um, and then there's Plant Vogel. Plant Vogel is a Georgia power plant um, or Southern Power, the Southern Company, um, and, of course, generates electricity using nuclear energy. The river is actually the shipping channel for the port of Savannah. Savannah, again, is about 15 miles upriver, um, and so ships will enter the river um, at the Atlantic Ocean, I'm sorry, at the Atlantic Ocean and make their way to Savannah where they will load and unload. Most of the drinking water for Augusta and Savannah come out of the Savannah River, along with probably 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 other um, little communities and towns along the river. It is here at Savannah that James Oglethorpe settled Georgia. 
Um, he was taken by Chief Tomachichi um, up the Savannah River to a place called Yamacraw Bluff, and that's where they chose to settle. Um, Yamacraw Bluff's about 40 feet above the river. So it was a good place, obviously. How many of y'all have ever been to Savannah? You walk down River Street? Yeah. Watch all the drunk people walk down River Street? Um, actually, if, if you remember having to walk down steps to get to River Street, the place where you walked from would be where Yamacraw Bluff was. In fact, there's a marker somewhere. That's not good. Um, that shows where they landed or where they think they landed. Savannah River Basin, um, between South Carolina and Georgia, as you can see. Uh, the Savannah River site, again, home of the Savannah River um, National Laboratory. They do work on nuclear material. Very um, secure. You're not just going to walk up to the front door and go in. If you make it that far, somebody is in big trouble, and you're probably dead because so. they don't want you going in there because it's nuclear material. Okay. Um, again, the world's busiest or the nation's busiest container ship um, port. Um, those things come in and out of there all the time. And you can see it's pretty wide. You've got two ships that are passing. And those are, those are big ships. Um, this is the, uh, the inlet at Tybee Island. Um, and I think you're heading towards Savannah in this picture. You can see Fort Pulaski off to the left, almost the top left of that picture, on a little island called Cockspur Island. Um, I think because it looks like the spur of a rooster. Just guessing. Um, anyway. Last thing, barrier islands. The barrier islands... Um, of Georgia are eight major islands and island groups. Um, and they are, they stretch along that 100 mile coast from Savannah in the north, the Savannah River in the north, to St. Mary's River in the south, right at the Florida line. So basically, from the South Carolina line or border to the Florida border. Um, they're known today as the Golden Isles. That's a marketing strategy used by the people of Georgia to attract people to the barrier islands. Um, although they used to be known as the islands of gold by the Spanish, by the white European Spanish trash, because they found gold on the barrier islands. But guess what? It was their own gold that had been lost at sea and washed up on shore or found by the natives that lived there. Uh, they weren't too smart. So, they, But they did call it the islands of gold. There's actually no gold on the islands, but eight um, groups or individual islands. Cumberland and Little Cumberland. And let me go ahead and answer the question, why Cumberland and Little Cumberland? Um, used to be one island but it was um, separated either by storm or just by erosion over the years. And today it's too small or Cumberland's actually pretty big. And then little Cumberland Island, um, Jekyll Island, probably heard of it. Um, St. Simon, Sea Island and Little Simon. That's an island group. Cumberland and Little Cumberland. That's an island group. Um, Sapelo and Blackbeard Islands. Again, an island group. Um, St. Catharines, Asabal, Wausau, and Tybee and Little Tybee are the eight islands or island groups. There's actually a couple of more, but they're so small that we're not going to mention them. Tybee, St. Simon, Sea Island, and Jekyll are the only ones accessible by road. You can drive to them. There have been bridges built across the intercoastal waterway. 
and you can actually drive to the islands, drive on the islands. Um, the others are inaccessible by road. You have to take a boat, or I guess you could fly a helicopter if you really wanted to. Um, the barrier islands are exactly what they sound like. They form a barrier between Georgia's mainland coast and the Atlantic Ocean. It is a, a source of protection for the mainland, for the coast of the state from the Atlantic Ocean. It protects it from wind, waves, um, currents. And they are incredibly important to the state's tourism. If you're going to the beach, you're going to the barrier islands. Um, this is where Georgia's beaches and resorts are. Not only is there tourism in this part of the state, there is also uh, paper production um, and also fishing in and around the barrier islands. Um, several years ago, I had the opportunity to go shark tagging. You catch a shark with a rotten reel, you get him to the boat, and when they're good and mad, you take a basically a spear with a tag attached, and you jab them in the dorsal fin, and then you let them go. They're really angry when you're doing all that to them also. So I caught the first shark. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning. I catch the first shark. An hour and a half later, I get her to the boat. An hour and a half. You're going to understand why. So I asked the captain, I said, hey, how much do you think that fish weighs? She was about six and a half feet long. So she was about 6'6". Six, six. And I said, how much does that fish weigh? And he looked at her and said, eh. 185, 190 pounds with a rod and reel. Mm. Hour and a half later. Anyway, I looked at her and said, she sure is pretty. She was pink. She was iridescent. She actually changed colors depending on what the how the sun was hitting her skin. And she was... She was angry. She was mad. Um, so anyway, we tagged her. I, uh, I threw up and then laid down in the boat. I was worn out. Um, so, but there is a lot of fishing, a lot of shrimp fishing. In fact, what we were doing was following the shrimp boats because the sharks follow the shrimp boats. Uh, did I tell you all we were just off the coast of St. Simon? So when you go into the water, just remember what's in there with you. Jaws. Yes, it is. So is Jaws 2. And do you know, Jaws is the only movie I have ever watched that frightened me as a child. It scared the bejesus out of me. It was... Brand new technology, too. They had a, a, a robotic shark they used. Anyway. All right. So these are um, the islands and island groups up at the north. The top, Tybee and Little Tybee. Um, Wausau Island, Ossabaw Island, St. Catharines Island, Blackbeard Island, and Sapelo Island are a group. Um, one I didn't mention is Wolf Island. Um, You've got Little St. Simons, Sea Island, and St. Simons. And it's easy to see how those three might have been joined together at one point in time. Um, Jekyll Island and then Little Cumberland and Big Cumberland are just Cumberland Island. Um, this is Cumberland Island. It actually is uninhabited. It used to have structures on it. People used to live there. Um, but after the Depression, um, most people who lived on those islands sold them to the state of Georgia and left. And so um, the houses that were there were and they were reclaimed by the island. Cumberland is their wild horses that live on the island. 
Um, they're actually descended from the Spanish horses that were brought here in the 1500s and were turned loose. And of course, apparently there were male horses and female horses. And so they had baby horses. Um, anyway, you can actually go and visit Cumberland Island. You can spend the night there. You just have to take a tent um, and plenty of bug spray. Yep. Jekyll Island, one of the developed islands on, um, on Georgia's coastline. Um, you can see there a lot of development. Um, that, I think that's the southern end of the island. There's a lot more up on the northern island. You can see the bridge that goes across the island. Sapelo Island. Hey, look at there. There's Sophia and her little brother. Yeah. Yeah, her mama sent me that the other day. Yeah. Um, Sapelo Island is actually inhabited, but you can't get there by car. You have to get there by boat. Um, a total of 70 people live there. One of those played or plays in the NFL. A guy named Alan Bailey. Alan, can you not read? Home of Alan Bailey. Kansas City Chiefs. Jiminy Cricket. Now, I show you that for one reason. To, to show you what you can do if you have a goal in mind and you're willing to work hard to reach your goal. With a population of 70, there is no high school on Hog Hammock or on Sapelo Island in that community. And so Alan Bailey got up every morning and went across the intercoastal waterway, either in a boat or a ferry, and went to school, went to football practice, probably played basketball too, went to bas and then came home. Can you imagine how long that day was? And was it worth it for him? Absolutely. But he worked hard to get where he was. It wasn't just athletic ability. He could have been a slacker and never left Hog Hammock community. Lived there with the other 69 people, but he chose not to. Um, there's Sophia and her little brother. Sign changed, home of Alan Bailey. Where? The Atlanta Falcons. Yeah. So, um, St. Simons Island. Um, St. Simons is... is um, inhabited, you can look to the right there, and that's actually a golf course. Um, St. Simon's is, yeah, um, it's, it's a resort, it's kind of a fancy smancy place to go. Sea Island is even more so. Um, you're not going on Sea Island unless you own property or you're renting property. It's pretty uh, exclusive, and then, of course, Tabby Island down around Savannah. Um, one of the things y'all did not get to do in the seventh grade is go to the Barton 4-H Center on Tybee Island um, and play around in the salt marsh and watch the porpoises, dolphins swim around in the salt marsh. And it was a lot of fun, actually. Um, anyway, so tomorrow. Oh, got a couple more pictures. Sorry. Shh. Okay, so this is the road that leads to Tybee Island. And as you can tell, it is flooded. It is not flooded because of a storm or a storm only. There was a storm, dumped a lot of rain. That's not what caused it to flood. Um, there was also a super moon at the same time there was the storm. And during a super moon, the moon is closest to the earth. It's as close as it's ever going to be. And so the tides are much higher. And so there was flooding. 1893 was the year the city struck Georgia. Um, hurricanes at that point in time were not named like they are now. In fact, they didn't know a hurricane was coming until it was right on top of them. So in 1893, there's this hurricane that hit the coast of Georgia. We've not want, had one hit the coast of Georgia since, um, at least not one of any size. 
Um, this is Brunswick. Shh. Stop drawing on people. This is Brunswick. And you can see by the horses how deep the water is. Water's up to their chest. And this is a few days after the hurricane hit. So um, it's been almost 130 years since a major hurricane hit Georgia. It's just a matter of time before it does. And it will. All right. Tomorrow, uh, bring your colored pencils. We will actually do some stuff with what we have been talking about this week and last week. So make sure you bring your colored pencils. If you don't have colored pencils, I suggest you get colored pencils. Or I will rent you colored pencils. A dollar a pencil, a dollar an hour. A dollar every 15 minutes. Depends on how many pencils you need.